Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back for this afternoon session. Um, the first speaker uh, for the afternoon is Julia Hartman, uh, who's going to talk to us about local to global principles for TORI over arithmetic surfaces. All right. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for giving me this chance to speak here. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be here in this room. Um, I have to teach with a microphone at home all the time, so hopefully this, is, this should work. Uh, okay, so my title today, as was said, is Local Global Principles for TORI. And I'm going to skip the rest of it in writing it down. Uh, those are going to be TORI over arithmetic surfaces, or arithmetic function fields, as we call them. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that um, when we get there. Uh, but let me not forget to say that this is joint work with Jean-Louis Colliot-Villain, um, David Harbiter, Danny Krashen, and then Harmala and Suresh. And how do you get this many co-authors? You write a big grant proposal. Okay, that's how it works. So anyway, um, so I guess I don't have to say why rational points are important, which is good. Um, and I probably also don't have to say why local global principles are important, because we've already heard a couple of talks about this. Um, so when we're studying rational points, local global principles play an important role. And so classically, we have a field F. So let's say a number field, and omega is set of places, and then for each v and omega, we have a completion fv. And we're asking, do we have global points if we have local points everywhere? And then in Harari's talk, we already saw that um, one important case is to study local global principles for homogeneous spaces under linear algebraic groups. And the crucial subcase there is the case of torsors. So these are the principal homogeneous spaces. And once one has results for those, one can often get results for arbitrary homogeneous spaces as well. And so we saw that these are classified by a Gower cohomology set. So this is a pointed set. So for now, G is a linear algebraic group. Later, it'll become a torus for a while. Um, and so then we can rephrase our problem as saying the local global principle holds if and only if the kernel of the local to global map on Galois cohomology is trivial. And since we want to study the obstruction to local global principles in cases when they don't hold, we introduce, just like in Harari's talk, the obstruction set. And I'm just going to write Sha because there's no Sha 2. Is there a parenthesis missing somewhere? Where? The kernel. Okay, my parentheses don't. 
Okay, yeah, this is right. This would be a big one, okay? This is a big one. And this is a big one. All right, Florian. Okay, happy? Good. So, um, so then otherwise, this measures the obstruction. To a local global principle. Okay, and we've already seen some results over global fields, but let me just repeat a few of those. So these are um, number fields and function fields over finite fields. And uh, I'll do this trick that I saw in one of the other talks here that I just write on all the names in a long list so I don't have to say exactly. Uh, and I don't have to write down names several times. And there's probably some more. So uh, if G is semi-simple, simply connect it then chat is trivial. So the local global principle holds. If G is connected and rational, and I think here you have to say F is a number field, then chi is trivial. And in general, um, we don't know if it's trivial, but for global fields, we do know that chi is finite. Now let me see if I can get this up. Ah. So this one does not go all the way up. OK, fine. So today, we're going to look at similar questions over semi-global fields. So what is a semi-global field? So this is a one variable function field. Over a complete discretely valued field. Which I call capital K. So our um, global, uh, semi-global field will always be F. Uh, and then we have the valuation ring R T, the uniformizer, and then little k, the residue field. So examples of this, well, um, since these complete discretely valued fields come in two flavors, these also come in two flavors. And the main examples that you might want to think of are when f is qp, so then k uh, is qp, r is zp, uh, t is p, and little k is fp. Or you can take an arbitrary field, little k, and you can take a Laurent series over that, and then a function field over that. And it doesn't have to be a rational function field, but that's just the example I gave here. So here's k is arbitrary. So if we think about these local global principles, and that uh, now corrected formula is still up there, and we're considering the kernel of such a local global principle, then really, if we look at this a little bit more abstractly, what we're doing is we look at the field f, and we look at some set of overfields of f. And we say, well, if something has a point, the torsor has a point, in every of these overfields, does it have a point in the original field f? And we can ask this for different collections of overfields. So in the classical case, we look at all the completions at places, but we can do this more generally. And so these semi-global fields are nice because they allow several natural sets of overfields with respect to which we can look at local global principles. And so I'll introduce those now. So let me just write that down. So local Wilbur principle, every time we have a field and a set or collection of overfields, uh, 
of s. We can ask what this local global map does and we can study its kernel. So these overfields that we want to consider for our semi-global fields are motivated by geometry. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is for a semi-global field, I'm going to take a nice model. So this would be an integral scheme with function field f projective and uh, of relative dimension one. We're going to um, assume it's regular as a scheme. Uh, for many of the things that I'm going to be saying in the first part of the talk, you can get away with it just being normal. But let's just make all the assumptions right now. And we also want the closed fiber. to be nice. And so what we're going to assume is that this is a union of regular curves. With normal crossings. And again, this assumption is really only needed later in the talk. But um, it's also not a big assumption because we can always find such a model. And then we call this a normal crossings model. of f. So now we have such a model, then we can look at points in the closed fiber, not necessarily closed. And for each of those, we can define an overfield, fp of f, and that will just be the fraction field of the complete local ring. So this includes the generic uh, points of components of x, and that gives me one first collection of overfields, which maybe I'll call omega sub, uh, sub x, sorry, um, of overfields. And then just as I said over here, with respect to that collection of overfields, I can consider the local global principle, and I consider the corresponding obstruction. And so I get. a corresponding obstruction set, which I will call Sha sub x. And now, of course, the question is, if I did sort of what I do more classically, and I looked at um, uh, valuations of discrete valuations of the field, and I looked at the completions with respect to those, how does this relate to this? So if I do that, then I find that there's actually a containment between the shots. So this, this one without an index is uh, defined analogously to the, to the number field case. So this uh, comes from the fact that every completion FV contains a field of the form FP. And you can show that. And then um, you get this inclusion of obstructions. Now there's more of these fields that we can consider. So if I think about this, I have all the points um, on the closed fiber that I'm considering here. And it's maybe not so surprising that those points where components meet should play a special role. And that maybe more happens there than at other points, and that I need to take care of those. And so one way to reduce the number of overfields that we need to look at is to work with so-called patches. So this is something 
uh, that I've talked about in other contexts, um, but it's also, also uh, been proven very useful here. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So we take a um, non-empty finite set of closed points. So this is a subset of x. And uh, we want this to contain all the intersection points of components of x. But it might be bigger. It contains all these bad points, but it might be bigger. And then we let u be the set of components of the complement. So this is, um, uh, so the elements of u are, are um, regular curves by what I was assuming. And then for each of these guys, each element here, uh, an element p in the script p, I've already defined an overfield fp up there. So I don't need to do that. But for u in u, for a component, I will define f u in the following way. So I take the elements in f that are regular along u. Now I take um, the t adic completion of that. And then I take the fraction field off that. So t was the uniformizer in R. And so now I get more overfields, and I get a collection um, so I get these fps for p in script p, and then I also get the fus. And I will call that omega script p. And again, I get a corresponding obstruction, which I will call sha p fg. And again, maybe not so surprising, I get an inclusion of that into the previously defined obstruction set. So I now have a chain of inclusions of these obstruction sets all as subsets of H1. And this inclusion in general is not so well understood. We understand it in certain cases, and in particular in cases that I'll talk about later. But this one is pretty well understood. So notice that um, we have a lot of choices for this set script P. So we can make it bigger, for example. And uh, there are different, um, so there's lots of these obstruction sets. And if you take a limit in a suitable sense of the, all the different ones, then you'll get this. So uh, let me give a quick advertisement for why you'd want to consider this, right? So if we're really interested in this, why do we want to consider the small obstruction set? Well, okay. So a simple thing to say would be, if we can show, if we want to construct counterexamples, then constructing a counterexample here will give a counterexample in general, right? So this is maybe for constructing counterexamples. And we'll see how that's useful. Um, but also, if you look at these collections of overfields, then this new collection um, that depends on this, this set script P has the property that is very different from all the other ones. It's finite. So omega P is finite and has an explicit description. And so we can hope for an explicit 
description of this obstruction set. And the last reason why this is really useful is also something that you don't find in the general, in the more classical local over principles, or also for this uh, Shy X version, is that if you have two fields there, Fp and Fu, and if P is on the closure of U, then we have F, and then we have these overfields Fp and Fu. And there is a common overfield of F that contains them both, which I'll call FUP. So this, uh, this pair UP is what we call a branch. And by the assumption that I made here on the closed fiber, it's uniquely determined by U and P. So I, don't, I can index them in this way. So this is a common overfield. And this allows us, well, first of all, so we, we get an inverse system. And one can show that the inverse limit is f. <laughs> and then also, it allows us to compare the local data. So if you have a local global, if you want to show a local global principle and you assume you have local points over the fps and the fus in, in this patching local sense, then uh, if p and u are related, then you can actually compare your data in this bigger overfield. And that's really what makes the whole machinery work. OK, so let me just. This is all the discrete valuations, yes. Yes. Yeah, I didn't write that down there when you said that. Let's see. Is this the first one? Is this the wrong one? Oops. No, I wrote this one down. All right, so let me just give a very quick example of what these, um, these inverse systems look like. Because we're going to be dealing with um, associated diagrams later. So you have some idea. So the first example is you could have x to be p1, and you just take one point And then you also only get one component. So you've just taken your P1. This is this thickened P1. And then you have some point P that you've taken out. And um, then if you look at this inverse system, then you just get F and FP, FU, and FUP. If you want a more complicated example, then by this assumption that I made that um, we have uh, a normal crossings model, um, the, the sort of the easiest complicated closed fiber that I can look at is something like this. So I have P1, P2, and then two components. And then if I write down the associated diagram, so then again, I get FU1, FP1, and then the field that they're contained in jointly. But then here I also get FU2, and then I get F U2 P1, and here I get uh, F P2 and F U1 P2. And I get one more, namely because uh, P lies on the closure, P2 lies on the closure of U2. So it can look a little more complicated. And in particular, there can be loops in there. OK. I already said that it turns out to be important that we can compare the local data. And one way to really summarize that, what we can get out of that, is given by the following uh, theorem. So when it's just the letters uh, for names, then it's a subset of the formerly mentioned co-authors. So, so we have this 
this inclusion of fields there, so we should, we should expect something like this. I mean, we get something like this just from the inclusion. I didn't leave enough space. Okay, let me do this again. So this is just on the level of uh, H naught, and then I can map to the product of the branches. Well, this is just rational points in G. This is over FP, this is over FU. And so if P and U are related and they have a branch field here, then I can just take an <coughs> element and then multiply it by the inverse of the element in the other product. And that goes over here. And then on the level of H1s, I get the analogous thing. But now, if I'm not in the commutative case, I have to write an equalizer diagram here. And um, the, this, is, this is sort of just general stuff. But the theorem says that there is actually a connecting map here that makes this um, an exact sequence of pointed sets. And now if we think about this a little more, what is the kernel here? Well, the kernel here is exactly what we called sha p, right? And so this will show me that sha p is trivial if and only if this map here is surjective, meaning that every element here, so this is just the product of these, right? Every element here can be factored as a product of elements here. And elements here. So I turned the answer, the question for a local global principle into a question about factorization in my linear algebraic group G. So the corollary is that this subtraction set has a double coset description like this. So the middle term runs over the branches, and then I'm factoring out on the left, let's say, by all the points that I picked in my set script P, and on the uh, right by the things that come from components. So in particular, like I already said, this is trivial if and only if I can factor. This is just saying that in a slightly different way. OK, now this one goes up. So at the beginning of the talk, I um, wrote down a few results that we know in the function field case, uh, in the global, um, global case, uh, global field case. And um, so one analog that we proved in this setup is that if G is connected and rational, then This patching sha is indeed trivial. But the question is, what is really the class of groups for which this vanishes? And we don't have a general answer to that. And at some point, that was sort of quite mysterious until um, Koyo Tulen, Parmala, and Suresh gave a counterexample. Which is actually a torus over f in the case where R is a power series ring. And the closed fiber contains a loop. It contains a triangle 
like this. And then, so they give an example of a P such that this is not trivial. So it's quite natural to consider the case of Tori more generally, and that's what the rest of my talk will be about, to see what we can say um, when we look at Tori, in particular when we look at very nice Tori. And by nice is, um, what I mean by nice is that I want my torus actually to be defined over either the model of the curve or um, actually for this talk I'm going to assume it's just defined over the um, valuation ring. Ah. I'm going to leave that for a second. So, because I can fit this here. So from now on, we're going to assume that T over R is a torus and I might use the term T as a constant torus. And why didn't I want to erase this? Well, I showed you this chain of uh, inclusions before. And for um, tori, like this, we actually get a chain of equalities. OK, now I can erase the rest. So the, the equality that we actually showed in this joint work is the first one. Um, so this is now for any p that's admissible in, in the sense that I explained before, for any script p. Um, and the latter equality was already uh, due to Koisel and Parma and Suresh and holds more generally um, when G is a reductive group that's defined over the model. So this was due to. <coughs> but now this is nice because from now on, I don't have to write Sha P anymore. I can work with the patches, but I can just talk about Sha. And so this is um, what I will do. So a key ingredient in this proof and also in the proof of the statement and also in what we're going to be doing later is to use a flask resolution of T. Uh, this will also later give us a very explicit description of Sha. So if K is any field and uh, T over K is a torus, then um, we can look at, at its character lattice. Uh, we saw that in a, in a previous talk. And uh, so if, it, if that's a permutation lattice, so if we have a, we were going to need the notion of a quasi-trivial torus, those are tori that are just of the form, uh, they're products of veil restriction. So k is, is going to be later our residue field, but here k can be any field um, uh, of GMs. So this is quasi-trivial. And note, and I think this was also said before, this is rational. And in particular, we have H1 KQ0 by Hilbert 9. And then uh, Roskazansky, Kajutalin, and Sansuk introduced, I think, the notion of a flask resolution and showed that these always exist and look like this. So this is the torus we were interested in. Q is quasi-trivial. And S is what's called a flask torus. And maybe I won't give the definition um, because all we are going to need is a property that I'll write down in a second. But what does this mean in terms of what we've been doing up there? Ah, no. Well, if I look at um, the uh, cohomology sequence that I get, and I look just at a part of it. Uh, 
And I get q of k maps to t of k maps to h1 ks, but then that maps to 0 because I just said that h1 of q was trivial. Why is this helpful? Well, OK, so this is rational. Actually, the h1 is trivial. So we know that sha is trivial. So we know we have factorization. for q. t is what we want to have information about. We want to know what sha is, so we want to know how far is t from having that factorization property. So the factorization here um, the failure to factorization is measured by sha. And then it's not so hard to believe that if you have factorization here, you're interested in factorization here, then you can instead maybe look at factorization here. So if you do a big diagram chase, Using what I said before, you will get the following. You will get that sha of ft, which we know is sha p. I just erased that double coset description in terms of the group g here. I can now write this in terms of um, h1. that doesn't look like it made things any easier, right? But um, there's a few things we can say right away. For example, there are examples known where uh, all these groups are finite. And now I have a finite product, and I'm taking a quotient of it, so that's going to be finite. You know, if these are finite, that's definitely finite. And so examples of that occur for, so these, each of these fields, uh, in characteristic zero, at least, if the residue field has characteristic zero, each of these fields is going to be an iterated Laurent series field in two variables over some finite extension of your residue field. And so if that is either, um, uh, if that is either something like Q or, uh, or it's a local field, then you know that these are, these are finite. So they're, they're, this gives uh, examples of where or you know, yeah, a class of examples where sha is finite. So we can conclude some finiteness examples. So let me just write this in this sort of abstract way I phrased it. If all of these are finite, then Sha is finite. But it also says, well, if we understand how these p's and u's somehow relate to each other, then maybe uh, this can give us a, a more explicit description of Sha. And we'll get there in a minute. Uh, let me just make a remark and say, I'm only going to use this maybe at the very end of the talk, um, but that this can also be written a different way uh, in terms of our equivalence. So if you like that, uh, t is actually c. R, and then here you get the product of T of FUs mod R, and then uh, FPs mod R. Because we know that T of K mod R is H1KS by results of Cauchy's limits. Also. So if you don't know what R equivalence is, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get to it later, but I probably won't introduce it. It's, it's just as a remark. Now, um, I said I was going to tell you one thing about flask tori, and the one main thing that we use, also some related properties, but one of the main things we use is that if S is flask, then for a, a complete regular 
local ring with fraction field L and residue field K, we get a specialization map from H1 LS. This is isomorphic to H1AS. And then this maps to H1KS. Uh, and since A is complete, this is also an isomorphism by Hensel's lemma. Now, if we use that in the diagram over here, then that means here we can map this to the product of the H1s, where we take the residue field at the point P. And it turns out that we also get an isomorphism from here. And here, we don't get an isomorphism, but we at least still get a map, because we can take uh, something uh, that's a kind of a residue field associated to Fu, and that will include into kappa P. So this is, in general, not surjective. Say it again. The green is hard to read. OK, well, then we don't use green anymore. I can just rewrite this in, in white. Thanks for telling me. This is much better in my, in my class uh, that, I, that I teach at home. They, in the mid-semester evaluations, they wrote the blue chalk. We can't read the blue chalk. This was after eight weeks or something like that. I said, guys, can you not tell me this right away? Anyway, so, uh, so we can replace these here by the residue fields. Now, um, this doesn't immediately give you some trivial quotient because uh, of the fact that at each of those p's, if, you, if the p is actually the, if this, if the set p that you're looking at is actually the set of intersection points, then every time you have exactly two components there. So there's two different ways how things map there. So, um, so, so you're not expecting that somehow this will, will match up and, and just go away. right? But. OK, so this is not subjective. But we can actually try to use this to understand um, the whole thing a little bit better. So the way we need to do this is if we want any chance of understanding this, this, uh, this factorization, we need to know a little bit more about the geometry of the curve. And we need to somehow combinatorially describe the geometry of the curve. So the object that allows us to do this, and that also played a role already in uh, results like this, well, actually not this one, but um, follow-up results, is the so-called reduction graph that we associate to our model. So well, to the model and that set P. So how does it work? So the vertices of gamma are just the elements of P and the elements of U. And then there's an edge from P to U. This is not directed, but between P and U, uh, if P is on the closure of U. So exactly in the cases when I have these branches, so I get vertices for every point and every open, and I get edges for all the branches that I have. So in our two examples from before, well, in the first example, that was P1. We've taken out one point. We have one P, one U, and there's one branch. Uh, and so it just looks like this. In the other example, we had two points and two opens. So this graph will always be a bipartite graph. So you'll never, had a, have, you'll never have a, an edge from a P to a P or a U to a U. 
So uh, in this case, it will be the complete bipartite graph on, on these two sets of two vertices. So it will look like this. Now, if you look at that product up there again, then uh, it looks like we should be able to say something, at least in the case when we can control that specialization map on the right-hand side a bit better. And so one of the cases where we can do that is when we assume that all the components are nice, they're all just P1 over the base field, and also that the intersection points are all k-rational points. In that case, what we get is that Sha is just a power of H1KS, because all the residue fields are now little k. And so uh, I just get a power of H1KS. And this one, m up here, this exponent, will just be the number of the loops in gamma in the reduction graph. So what do we see from this? Well, there's a couple of things. Well, one thing is that uh, we can see exactly when this is trivial. Well, there's, there's two ways in, in which this can be trivial. Uh, this can be trivial, or maybe there are no loops, right? So if H1KS is trivial, or if m uh, is 0. And then um, we have examples where it's not trivial. Well, all you have to do to get an example where it's not trivial of this sort is to come up with an example that has a loop. And for example, if you take something similar to the uh, Kolyotil and Parma Suresh example that I mentioned earlier, something that has a closed fiber of that sort with this triangle in it, then you will definitely uh, have that. And then you also need that uh, this H1KS doesn't vanish, but there are, are lots of examples uh, for those where those don't vanish. And in fact, there are examples where this is infinite. So we can even give examples where Sha if t is infinite. Does the, does the number of loops literally mean number of loops, or is it, or is it the first tiny number of loops? It's, it's, yeah, it's the, it's the rank of the, of the uh, homo first homology. But it's, I mean, it's basically the, yes. Yes, so th this is not strictly speaking. OK, and um, what I like to say in the last um, 10 minutes or so is, is two more things. One is, well, can we give another criterion for the triviality of Sha when the curve, meaning the closed fiber, is more general? So it doesn't just have uh, components isomorphic to P1, and maybe the, uh, the intersection points aren't rational. Um, and then also maybe mention one more other example after that. So let's see. This is the wrong one. Okay, so in fact, how would you uh, how would you show something like that? And, and that will then maybe give us an idea of how to get to this more general criterion. So what you can do is to gamma, uh, we can associate 
so this was our reduction graph. And we can associate, associate to that what we call a, a decorated graph, which just means that at each p, u, or branch, we have fp, fu, or fup, respectively. And then we also have maps between them that are sort of incorporated in the graph. And if I do that, then I can view this as a cochain complex con concentrated in degrees 0 and 1, where here I have the vertices of the graph with their decorations. And here, I map to the edges. Because whenever I have a vertex, I have a way of mapping to the adjacent edges. And so if I do that, then you'll find that sort of almost by definition, this will be the cohomology of this, uh, let's call this C of gamma. Of this, uh, of this cochain complex. And so the nice thing is now that because of this reduction here, because of these specialization maps, we can change the coefficient system in our decorated graph um, by exchanging the FPs, for example, with the residue fields, the kappa Ps, and similarly for the FUPs. And so in this case, for the FPs and the FUPs, you can already see that you could somehow cancel out some stuff. And you can think about these decorated graphs. And um, if you have uh, a vertex here and an edge and another vertex, and if the decoration here is the same, so you have a map to this edge, and if this is an isomorphism, then you can somehow forget about that vertex and contract the graph, and it won't change the cohomology. So uh, you can now go ahead and do that in your, in your uh, setup here. But of course, you can't keep doing that if you run into the case where you've had a loop, because then there'll be an obstruction to, to contracting it further. So, um, so this gives, if you work this out a bit more, you actually get this other theorem that we proved that uh, if gamma is a nice graph. So well, if you wanted to be able to contract it all the way, so if this is a p, then you have this isomorphism. But then at the next step, this would be a u. And then you don't generally have an isomorphism. But maybe you could just ask for it to be an isomorphism. Um, and so if gamma is has this nice property, which we call uh, being monotonic and also not having any loops, so it's also a tree, then uh, sha f t is indeed trivial. And so this monotonic, I can give the definition. Um, so to each, so we define the residue field of a u to be the ring of functions on the closure of u. And if we do that, then we can label each vertex that corresponds to a u with this kappa of u. And then what does monotonic mean? So a monotonic tree has a root such that when you go from the root and you go from one point to the, then between, um, between any two points, there's a unique path that contains the, the root in those two points. And so we, you can talk about which one is closer to the root. So one is the parent of the other. And so then when, uh, when v is the parent of a vertex v prime, then you want kappa of v to be contained of kappa of v prime. So this can be, you can define this abstractly, but in our setup, um, the kappa of u is always contained in the kappa of p. And so if you force this reverse inclusion, then you actually make them equal. And so that allows that you can then contract the whole thing. Because it's a tree, you can really contract it to a point. And so therefore, this cohomology will be trivial, and hence the sha will vanish. OK. Now, um, oh yeah, let me also say one more thing. So this monotonic, this <laughs> means if, that it's a tree over 
the algebraic closure if the characteristic is zero. But um, otherwise, it's, uh, it's a little more subtle than that. OK, so in the last couple of minutes, a few minutes, I want to go away from the case of tori and mention that these methods, well, I'm about to erase it here, but we had this double coset description, and I said you can also phrase it in terms of R equivalents. And so once you do that, you can actually um, work with more general groups rather than just tori. So, um, so we can uh, one can one can do an analogous description uh, via D of K mod R um, for uh, for more general groups. And this is work in progress, but what we get, one thing we get out of this uh, we get a counterexample namely we get an example where the patching sha um, it's not trivial for some G, which is semi-simple and simply connected. So this is surprising because in the semi-simple simply connected case, in the, in the classical case over global fields, we, we saw that this is always trivial. Um, here, I don't have a comparison result between the patching Sha and the Sha, but of course, this will apply that Sha is also non-trivial because one was the su a subset of the other. And so this is example is constructed in a, in a somewhat similar way, again, using um, a triangle and a closed fiber and then using SL1D, where D is a product of, uh, of simple algebras. And, um, yeah, and, and using sort of this explicit description with the patching, we can show that the Sha is non-trivial uh, because all we need to construct Uh, is a G such that G K mod R is non-trivial, and the reason why is that if you had, um, if you have such a G uh, and it's anisotropic, you can show that in this particular configuration in the closed fiber, if um, you had a trivial patching Sha, then we would have factorization, and the factorization allows you to actually produce an equivalence between. Uh, the, these two elements, which are which are not um, equivalent, so so then you get your contradiction. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, so I want you to ask something about the diagram, which is gone. The what? <laughs> I wanted to ask something about the diagram you just Which did. diagram which is gone? Is one which was there. Ah, okay. You say that the, the re right hand side is in general not surjective. Yes. But over K, everything makes sense. You can take the, the double corset product, uh, the double corset set, and so on and so forth. How much do you kill from what was coming from? Because the set in the middle is a, is a bijection, left is a bijection. But it's what not, do you kill? It's not, it's, not, it's not completely a bijection, right? Because if you have a P, then you have two branches at P. So, so you're still getting sort of, I mean, you're, you're, you're at best, with the P's, you're at best killing off sort of half of the factors upstairs. I mean, this is very ah, roughly so speaking. That means the notations were completely right. OK, fine. Thank you. They were completely what? Now, you, you wrote all the time KP. Even yeah. on the right hand side, but you really meant KP. Yes? Yeah, you can go to KP. You can go to you can. What what is an isomorphism is if you go to the function field of U, on the closed fiber, but then you sometimes you can go from there to little k, but not always. So for example, if it's P1, then you can. I mean, or if it's an, an affine open in P1, 
but if it's more general, then, then, then you can't. And also, if you have non-rational um, non intersection points, then, uh, then there you can get extra, mm -hmm. extra stuff. That means the theorem is true only with this hypothesis, yes? Uh, there is a generalization of that theorem. So for example, when you still assume that they're all P1s and, uh, and the, the intersection points aren't necessarily rational, then you get an, at least you get an exact sequence. Um, where, you know, with, with these two terms and then an additional term. Okay. If you don't assume the intersection point to be rational, you get some sub product of H1. Yeah, you get actually a quotient of H1 of KIS over H1 of KS and the product, and that's the co kernel. Yes. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Julie again.